live from Las Vegas, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube covering IBM Insight 2015. Brought to you by you IBM. Welcome back to IBM Insight, everybody. This is theCUBE, we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. A lot of buzz these days about Internet of Things. I, I love this example because we have an example of a thing that is a human. Dave Hasse is back, he's joined by Doug Barton who's the Director of Product Marketing for IBM Business Analytics. Dave Hasse is uh, an ultra cyclist. We first met you gentlemen at Vision. Welcome back to theCUBE, it's great to see you again. It's great to be here Dave. Great to be here, thanks. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Dave uh, cycled across the country, what was it, 3,000 plus miles yes. uh, last spring, uh, and then IBM wired him That's and right. captured analytics and heart rate and uh, monitored his system and I presume caloric intake and helped you fine tune your, your performance. So, uh, so did I get it right? Doug? Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, Dave had a lot of experience at this. When we met him, he was the three-time top American finisher of this race across America, and it is a non-stop bike race, right, from the Pacific, Oceanside, California, all the way to Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, and when the gun goes off, you race. Uh, if you sleep, you lose. You know, people pass you. Um, but with that said, we saw an opportunity to help Dave. Uh, I guess, as we put it, race is perfect race. Right, be ready for the conditions, be ready for the deserts that he would cross, the mountains he would climb, the windy plains of Kansas, um, and also put some foresight to work. Uh, our partnership with the weather company has given us an ability to look down the road and actually tell him when he should rest and when he should race. So those combination of things helped Dave uh, achieve a, a really good outcome again this year. So you were set up at, at Vision, you had a little you know, stationary bike going, you're going to do the same thing here, you're going to be wired up, feeding all the data. We actually had a channel on it, if you go to right. ibmvisiongo.com, you'll actually see an ultra cyclist channel with Dave pedaling away, yeah. which was, was, was awesome. So how'd the race go? Tell us about it, take us through the experience. So the uh, race for me, we were, uh, the goal was to race the perfect race. So we started in San Diego, took off racing pretty fast and uh, it, it was a great race overall. We hit uh, temperatures in the desert of 120 degrees, um, went through mountain passes. Um, it's 3,000 miles, 170,000 feet of climbing. Um, and uh, for me, I finished um, the goal to win the race. I finished second, eight days, 20 hours. Um, my previous fastest time was nine days in 21 hours. So we were a full day faster than I had been the previous race, which was in 2008. So, you know, seven years later, I'm racing a full day faster with uh, the ability to monitor myself and keep myself safe and put out an effort that was very controlled and consistent the whole race. So, I did, uh, honestly, the race was, um, as, as hard as it was, it was somewhat easy because we were so maintaining uh, our, the heat um, and keeping my core body temperature where it needed to be and just watching all of the other uh, factors in the race. That's phenomenal. So you came in second. Congratulations. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe it didn't meet your goal, but that's incredible. Yeah, we, <laughs> we won it first, right? <laughs> that was um, my first. But, <laughs> but the one, one interesting fact that I, I think we ought to share is how that is really a spectacular uh, outcome just to stay in the race. Half the racers that started this race would DNF, did not, did not finish this race. Uh, there was at the same time that the race across America started uh, on the Pacific Ocean, a shorter race, which was merely, I think, 900 miles to Durango. Uh, 900, right? <laughs> Nonstop. 60% um, of those racers didn't make it. The demands of that first Sonoran Desert, the 120 degree heat, took people out. You know, they efforted above a threshold for the human body to, you know, to operate a metabolism and in to in keep them fit. Uh, and able to continue. So when 60% of the racers on a shorter race succumb to that, it shows you the impact of our ability to monitor in real time Dave's core temp and intervene smartly, cool him, make sure he kept his effort below a threshold. You got to be in the race to win it, and we, you know, met that first challenge with that. Stay in it to win it, right? So how many yeah. people actually enter the race? So there were uh, 41 solo racers that entered, and 18 finished the uh, race. Um, and so the next closest person, third place to me was nine days and 21 hours. So I finished, so I was kind of. So similar to your previous personal best. Yeah, mm. yes, and I was 12, uh, 12 hours away from the first place uh, finish. Um, and, and I think, you know, the IBM analytics that we were using certainly played a big role in my effort and improving upon that performance. So we had a plan, you know, and we, 
used uh, the information we were getting from the analytics to change our plan along the way and constantly change that as we went, when I would sleep and when I would rest. But really it helped us make good decisions um, at very real times when they were needed to be made during the race. And that was a huge role in, uh, in, in the finish time and the effort that I made. So take us through the, yeah. the race. So you start in San Diego, and then immediately you're thrown into the fire, literally. You, you get into the desert pretty quickly, right? Yeah, the first 100 miles of the race, it's all uphill from the ocean, and you, then you drop into the desert. And um, at that point, it goes from, you know, I think we started at about 70 or 80 degrees, and we were at 110 degrees uh, within the first uh, 100 miles of the race. And then from that period of time for the next 300 miles, you're in a, that type of temperature and, uh, you know, at night as well, um, but it was still, you know, 100 degrees and monitoring that core body temperature became really important uh, for me. So the, the crew that I have along following, watching our dashboard in the car of all that data and all the things we were capturing um, was able to, you know, tell me maybe when to effort or when not to effort. And the biggest part was uh, keeping my body cool by using ice various ways to take my core temperature down so when it would hit above 100 degrees we'd cool down with ice or pour water on my head or to keep that performance at a very consistent level and uh, continue to ride you know into Arizona and Monument Valley and Utah was extremely hot during the day and so it was we were able to control that the whole time uh, was with that the, information. Was the feedback, I mean, obviously the data mm. was continuous. Was the feedback to you continuous? How did you get the information and how did you respond to it? So I wear a headset that my crew um, gives me information through. So they give me the route, you know, take a right turn here. But they also, you know, I can tell that my core body temperature would get a, a little hot. You know, I could feel my effort kind of like struggle a little bit and I'd be like, you know, what's my core body temperature? And they'd be 102 degrees. And it's like, well, get me some ice and a cold bottle of water and I'd pour that on my head, my temperature would instantly go down on my core body you and my effort. you to do that? Or nope, or you uh, just they do just, it as they'd pull driving. up next to me and hand me a water bottle with ice or um, periodically would stop and put ice on my body. Um, and strangely enough, the technology we used uh, down the road, we, we were using ice packs and different things and went to uh, using a sports bra packed full of ice to keep my body cool. We found that at the time of racing the best way to really keep me cool and um, the crew reacted to what was going on in the conditions and changed what they were doing to improve the performance. So, so a little ice bucket challenge while you're on, on It's on about the what it was, yes. Okay, so day one, you're in the desert, the first hundred miles right, right away. When do you first stop? How did you decide to, to stop and eat or rest or sleep? Yep, great question. So the food is coming from my crew nonstop. So they're passing me water bottles with nutrition in it. Um, we had uh, set in, the, in, in our mind that we'd ride 30 to 40 hours and the first day and sleep somewhere. So that carries into the second day of the race. Um, and we were approaching um, Flagstaff. Um, and the next city was four hours away. And within that um, dashboard window that we had, we had analytics that said it makes the most sense to sleep within this window based on the weather conditions you're going to be facing. And our plan kind of fit to that. So it gave us a very confident plan and idea that this is the time we should sleep. Um, so we slept in Flagstaff the first day. It was a city. It made sense. The next city up the road, there was nothing really in between was Tuba City along the course. And so that was our first day of rest. Slept for uh, an hour and a half and then got back on the bike and rode another. Uh, the next day we actually pushed to 26 hours because the weather and analytics was saying go a little further than what you originally had planned and we slept at 26 hours. Um, and then even day three we used that information to maybe sleep just uh, at 22 hours. In. And uh, so we did change our kind of game plan a little bit along the way each time based on the weather conditions. So, so yeah. So you had the, the Weather Channel guys feeding in from their API yeah. into your system. Yeah, that absolutely. Was one if I can just give you a little bit of picture of what this looks like. Um, the, it's a prescribed route. You don't get to pick your trip across America, right? It's a prescribed route. So we had the, the 25,000 geolocation waypoints that describe the route. And we knew where Dave was. We built a model to predict and estimate his progress down the road, and we would intersect then or join the geolocation with the time Dave would be there. And we would know the direction of the wind from the weather company relative to the road. And we would estimate how much help he would get or how much hindrance he would get from the, the wind direction relative to the road. 
So basically, we could peer into the future and know what Dave would face and therefore what yield he would get, like how far down the road he could get. And therefore, we could draw a curve and allow him to know the best time to rest so he would awake to the best conditions. When I say awake, remember, we're only resting 90 minutes or so or, or 120 minutes. So that's how we and, did it. And when he was sleeping, was yeah. he instrumented or...? Uh, that's a good question. I hope you took all those things off. No, we were yeah. um, charging most of those. So they're all battery powered, yeah, you right. know, and yeah. so they were being charged when I was sleeping. Uh, so we would be, you know, and then I'd wake up, we'd quick throw them on and take off again. Right. So did you have trouble getting to sleep or no problem? You no just, problem. So the, the Do you typically have no problem sleeping? Generally, or? I'm pretty tired when it's time to go to bed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but uh, so I'd pull into where we were going to sleep, whether it was a motel, the back of our van or an RV and go instantly in, take off all my devices. My crew would throw them on chargers. Someone would take my bike and then would sleep for um, an hour and 30 to 40 minutes. So we were, our goal was always to be off the bike no more than two hours. So any time that was spent, you know, taking off clothes or devices or whatever, that was part of that two hours. So generally I would get about an hour and a half of sleep each night. So in the eight days and 20 hours, I had 14 hours of sleep over that time period. And, and is that typical for the, the let's say, what, half that finished? The guys that are going to uh, compete to win that race, they're not sleeping very much at all. My competition, I think, went 42 hours maybe the first day before they took their first rest and gained an advantage there, and we were kind of chasing that advantage the whole time. And, and, and as far as, um, is it always sleeping, or do you sometimes just rest for... 15, 20 minutes or a half hour? Um, we generally weren't off the bike at all unless, you were sleeping. unless we were sleeping. That's mistakes I've made in the past is, you know, you get off your bike and then you're there kind of, you know, wasting time, so to speak. So it was generally riding the bike or we were going to the bathroom or, or, or sleeping. And you had to be awakened? Uh, at, at these intervals, or did you just kind of wake um, up with an intro? Most clock of the or? time, and strangely enough, I would wake up about two minutes before the alarm was set for me to get off, and I'd wake up and, you know, throw on my clothes, do whatever we were doing, and then get back on the bike and take off again. And, 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 to, and to the advantage, to pretty good conditions usually. You know, I wasn't uh, fighting, you know, a headwind or anything like that. It was usually waking up to favorable conditions and moving down the road as fast as I could because it takes a little bit to get your body back moving after you've been you know riding and then sleeping and riding again so uh, weather predictions sometimes can mm. be unpredictable right um, how did you find the the your, your ability to predict the weather were you like yeah, better than 50 percent accurate 100 percent accurate yeah, you know if, if the if, if the uh if the real tail of the tape, if it, as it were, would be our ability to predict where Dave would be, I can say we were spot on. Yeah. The combination of things, uh, it, I, have to, I have to tell you, we, we did learn a few things along the journey. Um, one of the things that where we deviated from race plan, and I, I know Dave wasn't keeping secrets, we, wor we worked on this hard, but he, you know, he did have a plan to kind of met out his effort evenly. 220 watts, watts is the measure of a biker's power, they're put into the pedals, right? He had, a, he had, him and his coach had tuned in and dialed in the 220 watt line to stay at threshold. And so we had modeled 220, but we found that our models were a little bit off. We kept checking the error rates and we were still off by 10% on where we predicted he'd be. So we, we found that we actually had to predict Dave's behavior. As he went up some of the, the steeper slopes, especially as we got into Colorado, he was putting out a lot of watts. And so our models had them too slow on the road. So we inserted predictive analytics to actually calculate and predict what Dave would do when faced with the slope conditions. And our, our estimates got much better. So the combination of predicting his behavior, again, he wasn't keeping secrets from us. I think his plan was to ride evenly, but the conditions, frankly, wouldn't allow him to ride at 220. So we had to kind of predict his behavior. Add weather, weather to that, and we were spot on. I mean, we, we could predict exactly where you'd be on the road. But the conditions yeah. wouldn't allow you to ride at 220. No. But, but you were riding faster than 220, if I just inferred. Right yeah, correctly. so at, at certain points in the race, you know, you're putting out more power because you're climbing a hill right. and, to, and that effort goes higher. And then maybe on the descent, you're coasting, so you're really not putting any power out or, yeah, yeah, you're, right. or you're pedaling yeah. slowly. So, but I think, I, I think what we you know we learned is that the effort and my ability to recover yeah. after s sleep was 
maybe better than we were okay, thinking so, it would so be. So that's the gut feel human factor, how, that's For, the gut feel, how you felt. Yeah. You right. said, I feel good climbing this. I'm gonna, it's not speed, I said you speed, but it's really output. It's effort, yeah. Correct. Effort, yeah. right, yeah. okay. And yeah. you said, okay, I feel good. I'm gonna really crank up this yeah. hill, exceed maybe 220, yeah. you know, sort of violate that threshold sure. that you guys set for yourselves. And then you were able to adjust to that pattern over the so, course so of the So our race. models learned. I mean, this, yeah. this is sort of, uh, in some sense, this is exactly what we describe in cognitive computing, the ability right. to learn and adapt. And, and so our models actually improved. We had to build a learning system because, I don't know if you remember this, but when you interviewed Dave and Jean-Francois Pouget, who is our distinguished engineer on this, he said there was a race to prepare for the race. Well, sure enough, our yeah. project had to get done on time. You know, Dave was starting with or without us. Um, so we put in place a model that we thought was a good first approximation, but we knew we could tune it. And by the time we got to Colorado, it was kind of like, we know where Dave is, you know, we'll stick out our arm with a water bottle and there, sure enough, Dave would be there. And okay. how, how, did, <laughs> how did your competitors react to this? Um, are they, do they want to do it? Uh, are they saying, oh, they're crying foul, or what's the so, story? So there, there's two stories to that, yes. Yeah, several racers were like, well, how do we use this? <laughs> uh, one actual IBM employee was doing the race as well, and she was like, I'd like to use this, but didn't have any of the equipment we use. She's not into using power or a computer or anything. Um, and then one of the competitors in an interview was making fun of, you know, he said, well, I'll just swallow Advil when I'm in pain. And I was swallowing a core temperature pill to maintain my core temperature. He did not finish the race. So, you know, I think what we used was effective and worked. And um, to be honest, it made the race really, um, I, I hate to use the word simple, but it was ride your bike. We've got all this information just keep going at this rate. There was one point in the race where it was like, hey, can you pick up the pace? Because um, we were getting close to the first place racer and they were doing some analytics on his speed and pulling up information for him saying, you know, in the next, uh, maybe but with 80 miles to go in this race based on your effort and his effort, you're gonna catch him. So we need to effort just a little bit more. So that gave me a little bit of confidence in my ability saying, okay, let's pick up this pace just a little bit. Um, you know, and then we hit some steep mountains in, in the East Coast and, you know, that changed a little bit. But there was, it kept me very confident in, in the racing that we were doing and the decisions that we were making, it also added. So from the, just the standpoint of, you know, learning, it was like, I, I feel confident. They're telling us to sleep. I feel like I should be sleeping. So this is a good decision to do it. So all of the decisions we were making racing were backed by information we had that also seemed very you know, very normal and what we should, how we should react. The, the invisible hand that became visible and guided you. That's right. right. <laughs> there is a lesson here, I think, uh, you know, as we use analytics in our businesses to uh, make smarter decisions in the moment, is that we can make them with more confidence. We don't spend as much time, kind of let data and analytics inform our judgment, right? It doesn't necessarily uh, overswamp intuition, but it can be there to, the, to guide. And frankly, you, you know, any effort that Dave would waste mentally thinking about am I doing the right thing would have been something that would sap his power, right, and take away from his, his ability to effort. So, you know, save those calories for something else. So, and did you take any painkiller? I didn't, no, no. And honestly, we were so perfectly, my crew was so good at hydrating me and keeping my body accurate, using information on the dashboard. They could see what I was doing. They could see my efforts. And, um, and hand me the right amount of calories and everything. So it was, there were points in the race where I just felt, you know, absolutely perfect. Riding through Kansas was a dream. We were just ahead of the wind, you know, so there's Kansas previous races has just been a nasty crosswind. And we had kind of a side crosswind, which is almost ideal. You know, it's, it was perfect. We were just ahead of everything never faced any bad weather conditions, and it seemed like we were always just right, almost on the perfect weather conditions the, the whole time. I never faced anything other than heat, you know, but from a wind standpoint, which if you talk to any cyclist, their biggest complaint is, well, I'm not gonna go ride the wind today, you know, the wind, the wind, and we had, you know, we didn't necessarily have the greatest tailwinds, but we never had a headwind either, so it was, it was very, uh, very good all the so way. Yeah, across. outsmarted the friction of the headwinds. What about solid food? No solid food during the. The week? only time I ate solid food was when, um, I shouldn't say completely that, when I would sleep. So right before I would sleep, we would eat some protein as solid food, and then um, 
fruit was our main source of, I guess if you'd call that solid food, yeah, sure. we ate a lot of fruit for other calories and then the rest was liquid, liquid calories. All right, Doug, and can you describe the tech behind yeah, this yeah, in yeah. some detail? So, a um, lot of tech in Dave and on Dave, as you might imagine. <laughs> I, I guess I would start with the core temp sensing pill. So I think you ingested eight of those during the duration. They stay in his digestive tract and, and give us information on the core temp. Uh, that was actually, uh, would send a radio frequency to a module. Module would go to the, the Android phone. Android phone, actually let me pause here, because that Android device actually consolidated a lot of the data feeds from the power on his pedals to his speed. Um, his bio harness, we had a bio harness on him that would give an ECG breathing rate, uh, heart rate, and those were the primary um, things that we would consolidate onto the Android phone and then send to our cloud. Uh, that technology is called the In Internet of Things Foundation. So securely using the cellular to cloud um, uh, data transfer, we would use the weather company APIs to bring in weather data about the geolocation points, we used uh, kind of our analytic technology to build the predictive models and then to calculate the what ifs. Remember that decision optimization really said, it kept looking out to say, where should Dave rest given the conditions we can predict for him when he gets there? And then finally, we would deliver it all back to a dashboard using our Bluemix uh, cloud uh, instance. So people had a dashboard on their iPhone and their, and their iPad they would always show Dave's location and these biometric and other um, you know, optimization recommendations. And the people that were analyzing the state of the human factor were what, data scientists? They were mathematicians? We had, we had one data scientist, Jean-Francois Puget, who you met yep. before. And uh, by the way, I'm sitting in this chair. There's a lot of great IBMers and other people that contributed to this. I'm so humbled by the, the team we put together. Um, really proud of that team. Uh, but Jean-Francois and I were probably on, on 24 hours, well maybe not 24, we were on 18 hours a day. We would sleep for six and we'd get up and find out where Dave is and we would you know, <laughs> do a little strategizing in our war room. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we were just in the cloud, if you, I, I, as it were, right, for Dave. So, but, but obviously humans were part of this, I mean, clearly with Dave, well, the design but, of the but in terms of helping yeah. optimize, yeah. you know, what percent was just sort of human yeah. You know, last mile interaction. Well, there was, well certainly, Dave got yeah. all his instructions through his earpiece. Right, of course. So we don't put a dashboard in front of Dave, we let Dave ride his bike, but he would get from his crew uh, the information. I would be in constant contact through text messaging and other things with his crew though, phone calls. Um, you know, we cooked up that plan to catch Seve. Uh, yeah. Dave, you didn't let us down, you know. <laughs> I, I, do, I should say really quick, as Dave kind of characterized that time when Seve's in Pennsylvania, Dave's coming out of Ohio, we picture a weather storm moving right between them, and I'm looking at the pattern of the winds, and Seve's got a tailwind, and there's Dave fighting a crosswind. It, my heart sank a little bit in that moment, because that's exactly what you don't want, right. right? The leader's getting the benefit of something that's essentially free and helpful, and Dave's suffering more, but uh, aside from that little moment of uh, you know, sobering uh, circumstance, uh, it was a terrific, a terrific um, you know, partnership, people working on it, but the systems really held up for us. Right, the models that we built were really good at predicting and giving us insight on the go. And where, right did, it, where did it end? Yeah. Uh, where, where'd the race end? Uh, Annapolis, Maryland. Okay. Right. Um, so we finished there and, uh, and, and you know, a lot of the things that happened, you know, so like the dashboard, I've seen the dashboard, but I've never seen it <laughs> physically working, you know, because I was riding my bike. And, and so, you know, we, we finished second, um, looked at all of that information and learned that uh, Seve, who finished first, uh, had a 1.46 mile per hour wind advantage across the country. Um, so he had a slight ad wind advantage. Um, we figured we saved 12 hours using the analytics. Um, there's other devices we can use, and so I think we're looking forward to uh, trying to improve upon what we called the perfect race, maybe, and, so and do it again. So you'll do it again. Uh, we're when's, working on when's that When's the next process. race? So uh, June of 2016, the next race is. Okay. Um, and so we're, we're working on uh, how to use a few other devices and how to make the system easier for the crew that I have along to use with you know less devices, but get the same information. So if you had to do it again, you wouldn't have slept the first First night, you would have gone I'm, the whole 40 hours to I'm, get that extra mile and a half. If I could, yeah, I think, I think, you know, that that's a big key, I think, is how far you can ride that first day as long as you can recover 
uh, the next days. And, and one of the racers, the elite racer who was supposed to win, Couldn't pushed recover. himself. And he ended up dropping out in, uh, I believe, Kansas. So yeah, yeah. Can't, you can't win if you don't finish. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, so, right. Doug, how about yeah. you guys? How, what, yeah. what, what are you going to do differently? Well, I think there are two things that we think there's another 5%, 10% yield to get out of these super athletes. Um, one is, uh, and there's been a lot of science put into this in sports science and physiology, so we're really proud to, uh, we'll have an announcement here soon, but there, there's a, a Watson ecosystem partner that's put the power of Watson together with their sports science understanding to assess the trade-off in when, how to get athletes ready to perform on race day. Now Dave's got a lot of experience training and getting ready, but the challenge with, with someone like Dave is, how much do I train so that I have a, the big engine for race day, but I get it fully recovered and ready to go so it's like optimally right, ready right. to perform? We have a partner in the Watson ecosystem that has put Coach Watson together. So you've heard of Chef Watson, this is Coach Watson. And we're going to put uh, Coach Watson on Dave's side this year. The second thing we're going to do is another real-time monitoring of what's called um, muscle oxygenation. So think of this as part of the physiology of efforting, especially endurance athletes, is keeping track of where you are relative to your threshold. You want to be aerobic exercise, not anaerobic. Anaerobic creates a lot of byproducts your body can't deal with over long distances like lactic acid. But if we keep Dave right up to the threshold without ever going over, we think we can get a little bit more effort out of him without doing harm to his body. So imagine this is just creating a bigger engine just by having a little insight. And what he wears is a, uh, it's an optical sensor on his calf to give us that real-time data feed. So those are two things that we're going to do that's going to get the next 10% out of it. Yeah, yeah, uh, 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 instrumenting the burn. So, and this, yeah. is, this is for me? Is that yeah, right? that's right. right. So, so that's a photo journal of the, entire, here, uh, uh, <laughs> of, the, of the race. So I'm really yeah. thankful that you guys came on the Cube again. I can't wait to hear what happens next time. So Dave, congratulations, and Doug, you too. We really yeah. appreciate uh, the story and the time. So well Thanks. done. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. All right, keep right there, buddy. We'll be back with our next guest. We're live from IBM Insight. This is theCUBE, right back. <laughs>